It's good to see this number here this morning. We have a number of visitors, and we're happy to have you here. As we go to God's Word, we're looking at what God has to say about how we should live our lives. And I introduced the subject this morning of looking at what is man's greatest need. How would you answer that question? In our humanistic society, in our secular society, some would say, you know, man's greatest need is a, a job. And you know what? I can take fish to people all the time, but if they have a good education to know how to fish, then they'll be able to feed themselves after I'm dead and gone. Good job? The man's a good education. He ought to have good income. Now, I think we ought to look at the poverty in our country, and we ought to look at uh, bad health, and, and really man's greatest need today is to come out of that poverty, have good health care, have their own home. And once you have that, if you've got friends, life is good. But you always need friends. And my point of reference, wonder if you have all of those things. And you go to the judgment unprepared to meet your God. And you stand before him as a sinner. Oh, I didn't think about that part. I got a good job, good education, I got good health and good, good income and sin. I didn't ever take care of that matter. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 8, that you were to exercise yourself unto godliness. And he explains in verse 8 why that is a fateful saying. Because bodily exercise is good for little, but godliness is good for all things. Having the promise of the life that now is, that's this life. Living godly has a promise of this life. And the life that is to come. Preparing for eternity is what this life should be viewed as. Not what I get and how I feel and what I should accomplish in this life according to my, my comforts and my needs. What good is it to be able to have all of these things and realize that I am comforted here, but you weep and gnash your teeth eternally in hell? What good is that? What is man's greatest need? I believe we see it in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 20 where the beseeching, the entreating, just short of begging, Paul says, be ye reconciled to God. Be ye reconciled to God. That's going to take care of my spiritual part of me. That is so important. Didn't Jesus say that if you gain the whole world and lose your soul, it profits you nothing? That's the point of this lesson from this scripture. You have not gained. That wasn't your greatest need. And if the gospel is about our social needs... Why does Paul in 2 Timothy 4.20 say he left Trophimus at Miletus sick? Didn't Paul know the agenda of the gospel? Did he not know the purpose of the gospel? It is health. It's my circumstances here. He left Trophimus sick. And this is a man can do miracles. He could have said the word, but he left him there sick. Didn't he understand what the gospel's purpose is about? Feeling our needs? And how come if the gospel is to satisfy our poverty, if that's what we should be looking at, our greatest need is to get me out of poverty. If that is the case, what does Paul look at the church in Smyrna and Revelation 2 and verse 9 and he says, I see your poverty, but you are rich. 
No, Jesus. Don't you know the, the agenda of the gospel is to give me out of poverty? I know your poverty, but you're rich. Because they're rich in faith. It was a spiritual part of them that they were taken care of. And how come... If the gospel is to satisfy my circumstances and for me to have my possessions, my home, my comforts. How could the Christian who is advocating the gospel, how could that person in Hebrews 10 and verse 24 ever take joy in the spoiling of his possessions? How could one do that? Because the gospel of Christ is not the health and wealth gospel of the social gospel that's so prevalent in our world today. What good is it to have your possessions, to have your health, to have your job, have all the comforts, and your circumstances are great, and you go right to hell and weep and gnash your teeth for eternity? No, your greatest need is to be reconciled to God. We're going to understand the basis of that. We're going to see the means of that. And we're going to see when that takes place in our lesson this morning. And all from this passage. Of 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21. Let's begin. What does it mean to be reconciled? Here's the concept. Change. Oh, I, I want to be friends. I'm reconciled. Well, that's kind of what happens. But the idea and the concept that I want us to have, there is a change. Romans 5 and verse 8. God committed his own love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Drop to verse 10. Because while we see what well, he died for us while we were still sinners and all of that. Now, for if while we were enemies, what was I? I was a sinner. What was I? I was an enemy. If for while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more being reconciled shall we be saved by his life? Please note that eternal life is based upon the condition of reconciliation. Reconciliation is not life. It is the condition that brings forth life. The condition before God. Being reconciled to God. I was an enemy, and now I'm what? What has my relationship become when I'm reconciled? I would say friendship. Because of James 2.23, when Abraham expressed his faith in obedience, what did God tell him to do? Offer up his son Isaac, Genesis 22. And when he did that, we'll find that he expressed his faith in the right way. And he manifest what faith should be and he was called the friend of God he fulfilled righteousness before God and he was called the friend of God what are we as sinners we're sinners we're in enmity with God and reconciliation we we've, we've there's been a change now it's changed to friendship now it's changed to friendship what happens when we don't do that we don't have to wonder how God thinks about the world today. How he looks upon our life today. Romans 1 and verse 18, that God has revealed his wrath from heaven. Did you hear it? Did you know when it came? Did you hear that sound? Was that on the news? He's revealed it through his word. His wrath has come down from heaven against all of the ungodliness of men. What men do that's ungodly and unrighteous according to his standard. To those who hindered the truth in that unrighteousness. What happens when we believe God? John 3 and verse 36. That's the good thing. When we believe God, that is a condition for being his children. He that believes on the Son, he, has, he hath eternal life. But the American Standard says, he that obeyeth not his son, or some translations, believe not, shall not see life. What's on him? But the wrath of God abideth on him. It's already here when we're in our sin. His wrath has been revealed. I'm a sinner. I'm an enmity with God. I need a change to be a friend of God. But if I don't believe on the son, 
I will not have eternal life. I won't be reconciled to God. And his wrath continues to abide on me. What good is it when you've got food in your stomach, you've got a roof over your head, you've got a good job, and you have good friends, and God's wrath abides on you? I'm not saying those things aren't nice. I'm not saying those things that we, we should not strive to have for our families. I'm saying if that becomes your greatest need, you've missed what the greatest need of man is. And that is, I need to be right with God. I need to be friends with God. I need to be reconciled to God. And you know what? He will set the standard for that. This word... Kata lasso is always used in scripture to denote that the guilty one has to be reconciled to the innocent one. Always. God's innocent. He didn't make you sin. He didn't entice you to sin. But we transgressed his law. We went against his will. And therefore we sin. That's why it does not say ever, God be reconciled to you. It's always, be ye reconciled to God. He's innocent. He has the right to set the conditions for that reconciliation. But that's what it is. Now, what's the basis of it? What is verse 18? All things are of God. That's what I'm saying. This is the ultimate. You have all these things in life. But here is the ultimate. You're going to be before God. And he says, all things are of God. Just like the woman and, and man relationship in 1 Corinthians 11 and 12. You know, man comes from woman and woman comes from man in that context. Man was put to sleep, rib, woman. But from then on, we've been coming from women, men. We're born of women. He says, but all things are of God. He sets how he wants that order to operate, not us. And so we go to his word. How should men act? How should women act? How should they react to one another? All things are of God. So he's the ultimate. God, what do you think about this reconciliation? I am going to reconcile the word unto me, and it's going to be through Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 18. All things indeed are of God, all right. But he says, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Through Christ. How was he the basis? How was all the world reconciled through Christ? Look at verse 21. Him who knew no sin, God made him to be sin. He made him to be that sin sacrifice for sin. Not that he sinned. But do that on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And we've already seen Romans 5, 8, and 10 reconciled to God through, through Christ. But here is just through his death. That's going to be the basis. That's how God is going to reconcile the world to himself. It's through Christ and therefore it's connected with Christ in this way. It is in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. How could he do that? Well, here's a concept for you. He accounted us righteous. How could he do that? He's God. But no, look a little closer to this concept because Paul will say it here in verse 19. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world in himself, not reckoning unto them their trespasses. That's what I said. He didn't count them against them. How could he do that? He's just God. That's his grace. Now we, let's go to Romans 4. How can that be done? Paul, the same Paul, will tell us. In Romans the 4th chapter, verses 6 through 8, when he says... David pronounceth blessing upon the man whom God reckoneth righteousness apart from works. Not our works of obedience, but the works of law. That's what he's saying. Saying this. How does he count that? Saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. That's how he does it. 
whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not reckon sin. His wrath is already on me. And if I don't come to Christ, it will abide on me. God, I am, how am I going to be reckoned to be right before thee? God says, I will forgive you of your sins. Now, let's just stop there. Will that be unconditional or will it be that condition? If it's unconditional, then universalism is correct. Everybody in the world that's ever lived will be saved. But that doesn't fit with scripture. Why is there a hell? Why is it the narrow way that leads to righteousness and the broad way leads to destruction? Nobody's on it if universalism is correct. That's not right. He forgives us. And we are forgiven. When we come through Christ, somehow his death, in Romans 5 and verse 10, sometimes his resurrection has a lot to do with my reconciliation and my eternal life. How will that happen? Stay tuned. We'll answer that from Scripture. What I want us to get, it's of God. It is through Christ. It is in Christ. That's how we, it's a basis of our reconciliation. And this is another element that's important. God just doesn't overlook sin. He had to be just with sin. That's his character. He's holy. And so we see in Romans, the third chapter, please turn there with me. In verse 23, here's our condition. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. We're going to appease his wrath. It took Christ's blood to do that. And it's our faith in his blood that we're going to be made righteous. And then he says, to show his righteousness because of the passing over the sins done aforetime, in the forbearance of God, for the showing I say of his righteousness at this present season, that he himself might be just, and the justifier of him that hath faith in Jesus. This grabs hold of that. And faith in his blood, through his death and resurrection, we can have reconciliation. But now we see the condition of faith. Trusting in his blood to accomplish that. And question. I read in Leviticus 4, and I just picked that chapter, and I read four times. When you're talking about the sins of the total people of God, when you're talking about the sins of the ruler of God's people, or when you're talking about the sins of individual common folk like you and me, when they offered a sacrifice that God authorized, the Bible says he forgave them. He forgave them. Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verse 4, please note four times in this reading that God has no pleasure in the sacrifices of bulls and goats. He would us not that twice. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Well, you forgave them in Leviticus when they did that. And God, you're telling me over here in the New Testament? He said, I'm telling you in the New Testament, how was I forbearing, Romans 3, with the sins done aforetime? Because God is always in the present tense. So the cross of Christ. It's only going to be through Christ that sins could be forgiven because he's got to be just with sin. He did not overlook it. And he wasn't just saying, you're forgiven. Take a lot, take a lot. It's okay. No big deal. No, he's, he understood it's with Christ. He's been his forbearance and his eternal nature. He's able to see that. But what it was, Jesus comes in Hebrews 10. I come to do thy will, O God. That's exactly what God will have pleasure with. And let's pick up with verse 9. He taketh away the first, meaning that first covenant, which authorized blood of bulls and goats. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second, which is the covenant apart from that. 
sacrifice of animals, through which will he have been sanctified. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. How come the Day of Atonement they had to bring another sacrifice? It was a reminder of their sins. Jesus is that one-time sacrifice that he had pleasure in, took away the old covenant, and God all the time knew that that blood of bulls and goats can't take away sin, but the sin, the blood of my son can. And that's how he was applying it. And when it comes, we realize it now. That's how he can justify it. It's through his death, his resurrection, God said, this is what sin demanded, death. And that cruel death, Jesus did. He did that for you and did it for me. So we could be reconciled to God. Now, what's the means? Very quickly. The apostles. He said, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Secondly, verse 19. We have been committed. What's been committed to us is the word of reconciliation. How is that happening? Well, Paul, look at Paul will help us in 1 Timothy 1 or verse 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. That should be 1 Timothy 1, 11 and 12. When he says, according to the gospel of the glory of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. I thank him that enabled me, even Jesus Christ our Lord, for he counted me a faithful appointing me to his service. Here I'm a minister. I've been given the gospel. He committed that gospel to me so I can indeed go preach it. And therefore he's appointed me to this service. service. In Ephesians 3, it was that word that he's setting forth that when you read, you'll understand my understanding of this great mystery that's been committed unto him. In verse 8, unto me and in less than at least of all the saints was this grace given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. To give man their greatest need, salvation from sin. He fulfilled that purpose. Not only are there ministers of the rec- word of reconciliation committed with that word, but how does he address? As ambassadors of Christ. The apostles were the ones that had the authority behind them to represent Christ to the world in the sense of preaching that gospel. They had the word of reconciliation has been committed unto them and now we as ambassadors, we've been chosen by Christ. That's not me. That's not you. It's these apostles. They had been given that authority to do so. And they were indeed the qualified witnesses. You might write down these passages, but Mark the third chapter, verse 14, why did Jesus choose the 12 apostles? So they could be with him and he could send them out to preach. Mark 3 and verse 14. When they had to pick a replacement of Judas, they say, here we need the one that was with us from the beginning and These are the ones that are going to be my witnesses or the witnesses of Christ. And they had to witness, be a witness of his resurrection. He said, beginning from the baptism of John and the day that he was received up from us of these, must one become a witness with us of his resurrection. It was not everybody wasn't going to be a witness. These were the qualified witnesses. What about human memory? Is our memory faulty? My parents are telling me today that my memory is faulty for what they did to me. They live long enough to make that argument. Because when you're young, your memory's sharp. But I'm recalling things. They say, oh, we didn't do that. But what about that memory? You know, these men, you, you can forget some things. Not the apostles. They were qualified because the Holy Spirit is going to teach them all things and bring to their remembrance all the things that I told you. That's what Jesus promised. They were going to be infallible in their memory. What power did they have? Oh, they didn't have just power to do miracles. They had power to give you the ability to do miracles. Acts 8 and verse 18. That was exclusively 
the signs of an apostle. And Paul, you weren't one of the original 12. And you're telling us you got the ministry of reconciliation. You're an ambassador of Christ. He said, I received that revelation. I wasn't taught it, but I received it by revelation of Christ. Galatians 1 and verse 11 and 12. And he had the power to go out and, and preach that gospel. He was an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. And those were the ones that were chosen by Christ to go and preach the gospel. They were committed with that gospel. Confirmation, miraculous works behind it. They could pass on that ability to do miracles. And he says, we're ambassadors of Christ. We have the authority of representing him in his word. Be ye reconciled to God. I beseech you. You think about those apostles. They saw Jesus give sight to the blind, give hearing to the dead, firm up a palsied body, extract the demons that were causing havoc on the bodies of people. They sit on his, listening to his glorious words as they were with him. They saw his voice steal the waters of the sea at a star. They listened to him speak in parables and then had the exalted privilege to sit in the house and let him explain what those miracles meant. They witnessed his unlawful trial and his horrible crucifixion. They saw them take his limp body off of that cross and put it in an empty tomb. And they were with him 40 days after he was raised, eating with him. They handled him with their hands. They saw the resurrected Christ with their eyes. They heard his glorious words. And they were committed with this gospel. That's who's talking to you this morning. Be you reconciled to God. There's no greater need. And if the apostles were here in the flesh. I beseech you. I entreat you. Be you reconciled to God. His authoritative eyewitness ministers are pleading that case for the Lord and you. When will reconciliation take place? Three points and the lesson is yours. It's not going to be through some miraculous sign done to you. Examine the New Testament, please. There were miracles going on. There were people listening to angels. There were people seeing a light. There are people being told by the uh, Lord to do things. But reconciliation came when these apostles, who the miraculous signs were upon them, they thin miraculous signs before the hearers. It didn't come upon them. They said, oh, you're reconciled. I'm waiting for something, Lord. I'm waiting for a feeling. I'm waiting for some sign. You're going to be waiting through eternity. Because that's not when reconciliation takes place. It's not going to be apart from the reconciling word by Jesus' authorized ambassadors, apart from his sacrificial death for our sins. We've seen this morning, that's where reconciliation takes place. The question is, how do I come through Christ and I'm in Christ so I can be reconciled and have eternal life? When does that change from sinner to friend happen with God? And the Bible makes it very clear. That change comes when I listen to that gospel, the word of reconciliation that the apostles preached that was committed to them. 
In Romans 10, 9 and 10, that gospel has come to all people, all mankind. But he says, it's only those that have the heart, the, the, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. We believe unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Jesus died for you, raised for you. He is the Son of God. Are you willing to confess that with your mouth? In Acts 2 and verse 38, the people were convicted of their sins. God's wrath abides on you. What shall we do? And they were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. That's when it's taken place. I'm confessing who the Lord is. He's the Son of God. I'm repenting of my sins. going to turn away from them. But I haven't been reconciled yet. I've got to deal with this sin problem. And the remission of sins. Remember, he doesn't account to us our sins because they've been forgiven. How are they forgiven? Not apart from Christ's blood. No. We appeal to the authority of the Lord through his death and resurrection. That's why we're baptized into his death. And because of his resurrection, we're raised. It's about Jesus. That's what baptism is about. He's the authority behind it. That's how I can get through Christ and into Christ. So I can have reconciliation. Now Paul is writing to the Corinthians. Is he not? He said, I want you to be reconciled to God. In Paul's presence, what did those brethren do to become reconciled? They believed. When they heard that word, they indeed believed it. But read it with me. Hearing, believed, and were baptized. They heard the word, they believed it, and were baptized. What happened in belief? Acts 2.41 will tell you. Those that received the word were baptized. They hear it. They receive it. They believe it. Jesus died for you. That's how God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That's how we can be reconciled to God. Question is. Have you taken care of your greatest need in life? It's a big question. I say that to young people. Hopefully you have many years ahead of you. We don't know for sure. And you get an education, you get a job, that's going to be on your mind. How can I be self-sufficient? How can I be in society and not have to depend on others? Those are wonderful thoughts to have. But why don't you get the greatest need you'll ever have. Why don't you get that right at a young age? How you do that is I need to change my relationship with God. I need to be reconciled to God. And if you're not in Christ this morning, I want to encourage you to do that. Get right with God. Be reconciled to God. Paul entreats you. He is begging you in the sense of appealing to you. Be you reconciled to God. Because everything is of God. You're going to meet God. Why not meet him as a friend? Be reconciled to God as we stand and as we sing.